minute before we get going. Um, I have been struggling mightily with, oh God, sorry, there's, uh, I'm, I've been struggling mightily with a couple of things. With Zoom, number one, that's a fact affecting this class. And I'm also trying to arrange to do some field research which I thought had been approved and now there are people all over the university saying, wait a minute, um, are, you need this form and that form and special insurance and it's been kind of crazy. So anyway, back to Zoom and class. Um, so what happened was, um, the okay, so the, the lecture from Tuesday, um, unfortunately, the recording didn't, it didn't um, process correctly. And so I have this like a couple of gigabyte folder. I've got these files that must have the lecture there somewhere, but Zoom won't let me try to unpack the file. They've changed something in their process and I've been with Zoom help and Anyway, long story short, um, I tried to re-record last night <laughs> and I, I, um, I did record the um, part on topo maps. I updated that uh, set of slides to, to make it a little bit better and to explain a couple of questions that had come up in class. And um, it turns out that my, the, the slideshow wasn't recorded. It only showed the very first slide in, in, in my PowerPoint the entire time, but it recorded my audio. I don't know what's going on. So um, until I sort out that problem, I'm not going to be using the full slideshow with the PowerPoint because that apparently was the problem. Like I can successfully um, show you the PDF and go through the slides or I can show you the uh, the slide sorter where you can see them all. So I'm going to do it that way and that way you can also see my pointer when I point to things. Um, but anyway, so the I put those new slides about topo maps and about map scale and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a short video from Vox. Um, I put all of that in the folder for this week's lecture along with the audio file um, of me speaking over the slides. And so what you're gonna need to do is to listen to the audio file while you go through the slides. So you're gonna have to progress through and listen to figure out which slide I'm on. Um, I'm sorry about that, but like, I just, I can't record this thing a third time. <laughs> it's just, it's, there's not enough time in the day or night. I was up until, 11 just trying to deal with that part of the um that part of the the lecture um i have not yet re-recorded re the part on the the middle section of slides for earth history so that's kind of a longish powerpoint it was um it was like 45 or 50 slides and we've only gotten we've gotten about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through um, but that middle part, that part of the lecture is not on iLearn yet. So if you've been, if you missed Tuesday or if you've been working asynchronously, um, give me until, give me until tomorrow to, because today I'm already, I'm like solidly booked. So I don't think I'll be able to record in, at least until late tonight. Um, okay, so if you've got questions about any of the slides as we finish up that lecture today, I'm happy to go back and look at those slides and talk about that again today. Um, I just don't wanna start over in the same place so that everybody has to, to listen to me repeat myself. Plus today is supposed to be about the lab, right? So um, why don't I start with, are there any questions about anything so far in the class about anything on iLearn? or anything we're, we've done so far, before we get into specifics about the labs, that is. Just give it a second. And you can put it in the 
the chat if you would like, although it's um, it's a little bit tricky for me to keep track of what's going on in the chat and teach at the same time. It's like I need someone to help me look at that, uh, but I will try to. Okay, I did something. I want to talk about two things. I did something kind of fun with the survey results. I created a word cloud. I want to share it with you. Okay. Erg. Okay. So this is the word cloud that came from the topics that you want to learn about in this class. Uh, so how the how earth formed earth's composition rocks were really were mentioned by several people maps landforms was mentioned a lot of times so we will definitely talk about a lot of different landforms in this class for sure we're definitely going to spend time on rocks we've got um we've got minerals one day igneous rocks metamorphic rocks and sedimentary rocks so four weeks or a month essentially we're going to be looking at different kinds of rocks but it's not just rocks right because rocks different kinds of rocks occur in different places on earth for a reason and that reason is usually plate tectonics um, so anyway i wanted to show you this um, fossils came up a couple times and that's what this week's lab is all about uh, volcanoes so just just so you know um, we the very end of class we will touch on climate change I see that that's an interest of everybody and as well as it should be so um, that that will happen I think we'll touch on all of this so anyway that's that Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we start on the specifics of uh, our labs and to finish off that lecture is um, last Friday I held an extra study group on from like 11 to 1 on Fridays and I sent out an email and it was fairly well attended. I mean, I, it was like five or six people who ended up showing up, which is not bad actually. Um, but I don't know if that's a uh, a good time for everybody or if we should be considering different times. Like, is Monday better because you've had the weekend to work on your lab already and so you've got questions trying to finish it up or something like that. So um, uh, I wonder if we can um, take a vote on that. Please use, let's see, um, if you have a specific rec uh, suggestion, please put it in the chat box. But why don't we try um, using the yes, the yes or the thumbs up button um, to say whether Friday from 1 to 11 is a good time to keep a study group if, if you want one. If you don't want one, please say no. Does that include office hours? Sorry? Does that include office hours? Or will office well, hours office hours, I'm always here after class. No one ever seems to stick around, or at least so far. So my office hours, I, I stick around for the half an hour after Tuesday from 12, 30, 12 to 1230 um, to take questions and to, to work on anything. Um, but no one's shown up yet. Um, and no one's made any appointments with me to talk specifically about their work. So I thought that um, adding an extra study group um, might be beneficial. Now we can, I can certainly do all of this during the office hour time. I wanted to just, but it, you know, it's after we've been online for an hour and a half and I can see that people are getting tired and they're like they, they're tired of sitting at the zoom screen and I, I totally get that. So um, if you let's let me change the question a little bit. If you do want, no matter what day or time it is, if you do want an extra time period, not office hours, but an extra time period, Friday, Monday, maybe Wednesday, please say yes or thumbs up. And if you don't want extra time with class, please say no. 
in the participants window. Oh, I had emailed you about help for the topo ref maps for the end part. I figured it out, but I still have a little bit of questions. Okay, we're going to talk about that today. We'll get to that. Don't worry. But um, I had submitted it already, but we, we are able to unsubmit, but. Yeah, you can always submit something on top or replace that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, right, I talked about, um, I talked about that a little bit on Tuesday. I don't know if you were here Tuesday, um, but I did mention, um, are you referring to the question about how to locate the center, the find the latitude and longitude of the center of your topo map? Yes. Yeah, I, I did. Video. I looked Say up that again? Video. I looked up a video. Oh, cool. Okay. What'd you find? What did um, it tell you? It kind of told me, but then again, it was kind of confusing because they were explaining multiple things inside of the video. Yeah. I was a little confused. Well, I guess my short answer, I started, someone else asked the same question and I started to answer that on the forum and I, I simply haven't gotten to it yet because it's been that busy. Um, number one, you've got a, a bar scale at the bottom of your map. And so you can measure across the bottom to see how wide is your map in kilometers and how, how tall is your map in kilometers. And then you can divide it in half to find the center point. Um, there's also the, I talked about, and I, I, this is in the audio plus slides part of the lecture folder. Um, the audio recording of me explaining. Um, I also explained the the UTM, the Universal Transverse Mercator grid system, and that's marked in brown lines on the topo map. So each one of those is marked around the edges um, in a number, and each one is about a is a kilometer wide and a kilometer tall. So you can you can find the middle of your map pretty quickly or guess get really close to the middle of your map really quickly using your bar scale as well as the UTM grid that's on your map. Um, I can show an example and why don't I because you I'm guessing that that's just talking about it is not enough. Let me see if I can dig up a map real quick. Um, I'm gonna, okay. I'm just gonna share my screen and let's Okay, let me share real quick. Okay, so this is just, I, Oh, this is not the site I thought it was going to be. This is a, another place. I just Googled um, USGS topo map download, and this is where it brought me. Um, so you can, up in the search here, you can choose location or map name, and I'm just going to search San Francisco North. That's the map that I used as an example um, on Tuesday and in my lecture. So you get this long list of different products here. And the first thing I'm seeing is the year. And we don't want a 1956 or a 1933 map. We want the newest one. So that's 2018. And it opened a new window. Let me, let me stop this share and share the other window with you. Here we go. Okay, so I got to zoom in. Okay. So up, let me just get in closer. Will it let me? Yes. Okay, so um, the latitude and longitude are marked right here. 37.875 degrees north latitude, 122.5 degrees. Uh, west longitude. That's this corner of the map. These numbers right here are in actu are actually in meters north and meters east. 
that's a different grid system. That's the UTM grid system. And that's what these numbers are. So it goes 44, 45, 46, 47. You see these brown, these faint brown lines on there. That's the UTM grid that I'm talking about. So each of those is a kilometer wide. Whoa, a little too far. Is, is a kilometer wide. I was going to show you the, the legend here. So if you look at the scale bar, um, there's zero kilometers, one kilometer, two kilometers. Um, each of these is one kilometer wide. And it's a little bit hard to see those squares here. I'll, I'll show you. There's a square around Alcatraz Island. So each of these squares is a one kilometer high and one kilometer wide. And so one way to find the center of your map, um, or at least get close really quickly, is to um, count those squares and or rectangles, I suppose. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we need five and a half. So the middle of that fifth square. There's your middle, at least left to right. And then top to bottom, you can do the same thing and find the middle. And then it's asking for the latitude and longitude. So um, that's it. so once you find that you can um also find the middle uh longitude by finding the middle of these numbers here in that same square that's that forms the middle on the utm grid um so you can estimate there knowing that there are um and that's mostly the scale bar frankly and then you you need to know that there are 60 seconds in one minute of a map, 60 minutes in one degree of a map. And um, that will help you to find the center. Um, is that good enough to get you going at least? Um, have other people had the same problem or other people approach it a different way? Anyone? No, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So I hope that that got you start. How did you end up solving the problem, Ashanti? They showed me a different way on the YouTube video. Okay. By starting on like the left side of the map. Yeah. Like, counting over. Okay. I'm not sure if I did it right, but. I did it to the best of my knowledge because I was a little confused. If you guys get close, close to the right answer, that's good enough for me. Um, because honestly, as far as like, even as far as like navigating, I, I found a video too actually, and it was like to figure out what's the latitude and longitude of a particular point on a map, not necessarily the center. And they used a, you know, a different method to kind of just narrow down the area first. And then they measured using the, the, the scale bar to get um, it more precise. But even then it's like, eh, it's about here on the map. If you get close, you'll probably find your destination. So that's why I think close is good enough um, for the purposes of this lab. Okay, so I'm seeing a few votes. I'll answer the chat questions in just a second. Um, oops. So, I see five yes votes, six, seven yes votes, two no votes. Okay, so for the people who would want extra, I assume that's the vote for class time, extra class time. Um, I'm gonna clear your votes. For people who would like the extra class time, or at least like the option, um, is Friday 11 to 1 a good time to do that? Can I see a yes or no for that? Okay, so I see one no. I assume, Davino, that means that you might want to go to the, to the, um, study group, let's call it, but 11 to one on Fridays is not good. Would one to three be better? 
I'll, I'll, I'll ask that question again. Is one to three on Friday a good time? Aha, uh -huh. no is not good. All right, is, um, that's answering my question. Is Friday morning good, like nine to 11? Let's try again. Still not. Okay, so it seems like, um, okay, Friday is not gonna work for Divino, um, but it will work for the others who are um, responding. Um, maybe you, can you send me please a, a private chat or some, or an email or something letting me know when you can meet? Because, you know, there's, we could use time on Monday. I'm not usually available in the mornings. I usually have my mornings tied up, but after two o'clock on other days, I, I free up. So um, you have classes Friday. Okay. Um, well, um, it's probably gonna be the case that whatever time I choose, it's not gonna work for one or two people. And so I guess I'll suggest that it looks like Friday overall is a good time for most of the people, everybody except you, I'm afraid. Um, so why don't we use a system of, you can watch the study group recordings and email me questions or set up a, a private Zoom session where we can talk about your labs. Why don't we work on it that way? Okay, for anyone who doesn't, um, who can't meet at that Friday time. Okay, um, there's a question. Is there a quiz for this week? No, I haven't added a quiz. It's the same quiz as last week. This week is all about catching up. So um, I want it, you, you have three quizzes so far for the semester. It's still those same three quizzes for um, the introduction, which is basically like how science works. Um, uh, what was our first topic? Earth history was one. Oh my God, I've forgotten what the second one is. Let me open. You guys can tell me faster probably. Oh, wait a minute, quiz. Quiz one is understanding science. Quiz two is earth history. Quiz three. Oh, there isn't a quiz three. Oh, it's not. Oh, there's only the two so far. Okay. So um, no, I didn't set up another quiz. Yeah, it's just the, it's just earth history what? and the understanding science. There's like, one more quiz I think you set up, I've seen, with 23 questions. I see, that's next week. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, 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 that's next week. Um, so we get to geologic time next week and there will be another quiz then in another new lab. But what I wanted, because it seemed like people, we st I started off too, it was my fault. I started off too quickly. I didn't realize that the topo map lab would take as long as it did. So um, that's why we're slowing down. Uh, I hope that everybody is able, has turned in their um, observation interpretation lab and done that quiz and that you will turn in your topo maps lab this week if you haven't already. Um, today is a chance to ask some more questions. Um, and then the earth history, so the, the exploring fossils lab with the video with Lisa White explaining the fossils from the Kettleman Hills. There's a virtual field trip. Those are the two things that, and, and to look through the lab to like read what we're gonna do or read through it as you watch the, the, the virtual field trip. That would answer some of the questions on the lab actually. So um, those are what I was hoping for. So it says for the next question, for the pre-lab were we supposed to just look at the virtual field trip, VFE, I think that's the virtual field experience. Or are we supposed to fill out the worksheets too? Yeah, so the worksheet, the worksheets are the lab and you will be able to answer those questions with the virtual field trip and the explanations that um, Lisa gave in that video. So um, if you haven't started filling it out, uh, today's a great day to start. 
but that's those are the two things you'll use in support of them completing that lab. When it says due Friday, does that mean anytime Friday? Yeah, basically, I because I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna grade them Friday um, or anything like that. I, I just want them submitted so that I get a chance to catch up over the weekend and usually like grade things over the weekend or maybe Monday before class. So that's why um, that's why the Friday I say Friday midnight instead of saying midnight because it's confusing whether you mean like which day do you are you talking about i say 11 59 pm to make it clear which day i'm talking about so there is a lab for this week um there are three labs so far there's the first one was un, under it's it's um observations and interpretations right second lab is topo maps third lab is the exploring fossils so um i'll show you the iLearn page so if you ever have questions, the first place to go is iLearn because I put all announcements, um, except for that one question you asked Ashanti, I put all the answers to the questions in the Q&A forum up here. So all the announcements there, all the Q&A, and follow along using um, what's here. So week one, all that stuff, week two, and I move some of those things from week two into this week to just, like show you all right this is what we're doing this week so um lecture three on earth history that um that was the continuation of the earth history lecture from last week and then this lab is this week's lab okay so um here are the three things that you need i ask that you what or you look at this virtual field trip so it requires looking, you've got to read the page, the web page, and look at the pictures. I mean, it's the, it's any video or pictures on the virtual field trip that um, really enhance the reading. And so it's important to, to do both and not just like scroll through, say, yeah, 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 so it looks like dirt, it's a bunch of rocks. Okay, there's a fossil, cool, whatever. Um, read it and that that actually contains a lot of your answers and then this video by Lisa White she um, is standing in her lab at the uh, Berkeley Paleontological Museum showing you the fossils of the Kettleman Hills so I think she must have done uh, her research maybe her PhD thesis even in the Kettleman Hills that's just a guess. I certainly know that she used to take our geology students on field trips to the Kettleman Hills every year and they loved it. Um, unfortunately though, it's pr on private land now and the landowner does not like fossil hunters. So um, it's off limits and behind fences and stuff, unfortunately. So we've got to kind of rely on the images and the, that we've got in this virtual field trip. So I couldn't take you even if I wanted to in this case. And the um, the lab, blah, blah, blah. There is, I think that it's a relatively short lab because it, um, it asks you, ugh, the formatting here again. I think this formatting problem resolves itself when you open the document as a, a Word document or in Google Drive or as a Google Doc, I mean. Um, the link to the virtual field trip is there. Um, the link to the video of Lisa White is here. And these images from in the, the worksheets themselves are straight from the virtual field experience page. So um, this is what it's asking you to do. On the following pages, use the boxes provided to sketch the fossils and the features of the outcrop or um, and or write your your explanation to the question um, about each of the fossil zones. So um, the idea is to go through the different um, fossil zones that have these crazy names <laughs> that uh, I'm not used to saying. Patinopectin is probably how you would say that zone, which describes um, fossils. So animals, fossils are just like the remnants, the the, the lithified remnants of living animals. So these are animals that lived in a particular 
part of earth. And in this case, they were in a lake or under the ocean, like offshore, um, offshore a beach, offshore a coastline, and at some depth of water. Animals like have preferred climates that they like to live in or, or zones with different light or different um, food sources. And so um, that's what these different zones are all about. And the rocks that you find the fossils in tell you a lot about the, the zone, the climate that the animal like to live in. So if it's in a sandier zone, if this is, we're talking about um, marine animals, then a fossil that you find in a sandy uh, outcrop that's telling you it was closer to shore than if it were in like a mudstone that is much further offshore because sand grains are kind of big pieces of sediment and they're heavy and when they um, when they wash off the beach by wave action and end up in the water column they settle pretty quickly and so they're close to shore even though they're, they're underwater um, compared to animals that li might live in deeper water that's further from shore, that tends to be finer grain. So you don't get the sand grains, it's more like mud and clays that end up there. And so um, the rock really does tell you quite a bit. And that's why this lab asks you to, to sketch the fossils, because sketching is a great like hand-eye memory um, tool that you can use to like learn these things. So sketch out the different features. It's a great time to do it while you're watching the video of Lisa White because she's holding them, talking about the shape, talking about the particular features that you should notice. Um, and then I just want you to sketch them here. So there are different examples there um, and use this box to, you can sketch and you can write in your answer, whatever you like. Um, you know, hand sketching, you're going to have to print this out, or maybe you've got a, a pencil tool you can use to, to draw on here. Google drawings would probably work. Um, it's just a little bit harder to control with a mouse or a trackpad, I think. Uh, but that's totally up to you. It doesn't have to be perfect. The idea is just to notice and learn about these features. Um, so that, that would be the patinopectin zone, and then it goes through this Macoma zone. The rocks look a little bit different. The fossils look a little bit different. And so here you would ske sketch and, um, and answer the questions below. So um, for example, here's the, the next zone, the siphonalia zone. I think that must be like clams that have siphons, these long probes that they send up through the sand, uh, which is probably one of these things. Um, the burrow, oftentimes there's trace fossils, which means not the animal itself, but evidence that the animal was there. So a trace fossil might be a burrow that a clam dug to get to wherever it lives in the uh, uh, subsurface. And those burrows sometimes get filled with a different kind of material. And then you can see that difference and see the burrow in the outcrop um, as it weathers out. So one of the, an example question would be, you know, use photographs one and two from this zone to observe the sandstone rocks there. What do you notice about the rocks in terms of the color, the layers, the sizes of sand grains? that's different from the sandstone in the other zones of the Echigoin. Did I say that right? I'm not sure. Um, if you, I have to listen to Lisa say it again. <laughs> um, so that's really all you're doing is you're, you're sketching this out and that's all I want in this lab. So I think it would go fairly quickly, but it is important to take the time to listen to Lisa and she talks a little bit slow, like you might be able to do one and a half times speed, but don't try to speed through it at two times or anything like that. Listen to her. And then you can have your lab in front of you and you can do your sketches in these boxes as she's talking. Um, 
I would, I guess I would do the virtual field trip first, and then I would watch Lisa's video because it makes a little more sense what she's talking about, although it can work either way. Um, second question was using photographs three and four, describe some of the features in the shell in terms of the series of bumps that are visible. How do the fossils of this zone compare to the Macoma zone? So you're looking at changes in the fossils and changes in the rocks from each of these zones. So these aren't, um, these aren't meant to be difficult questions. These are meant to be descriptive. You're describing what you're seeing. You're, you're seeing, you're making observations and then you're sketching what it looks like. And literally, you know, as a geologist, when I go into the field, we have field books with us. And not only are we taking written notes and measurements and all that, but we're also sketching outcrops and showing things like this fossil, there's a fossil bed here that um, stands out from the rest of the rock. Now, you can't see a ton in these photos, but you can totally see a magnified version of these photos or zoom in on some of them really closely so that you can see the fossils in great detail on that virtual field site. And that's why I'm sending you there because even though these are the same photos, you can see it a lot better online. Okay, and are there any, are there any other questions about this lab, at least for this moment? That's, that's what I wanted, that's what I want from you. And then, so there's several of these, uh, I, and then the very end, it, the kind of question changes a little bit. Oh, you've got these definitions too. So there were uh, uh, some definitions. There's a glossary on the page that links to this, the top of this lab. So you can go to the glossary. Just don't type in the, uh, you know, don't copy and paste from the glossary. Write it in your own words, okay? Um, and then you're, you're gonna make some measurements and write some notes about any of these fossils. And then it talks about the environments that these animals lived in. And so, for example, here's a sketch showing um, sand dollars, crabs near the surface. Um, are those barnacles, clams, mussels, snails, scallops down deeper water? So, and it's showing fresh water, fresher water near the surface, sea water down below. That's because the surface water is running off into the ocean. So salinity probably changes. And then it looks at um, the geologic past of California. So this map shows, um, here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit better. Please stop me if you've got questions, because I feel sometimes like I just, yeah, I'm just talking at you guys and I wish this was more interactive. So feel free to stop me. Okay, so it looks at the Kettleman Hills area um, in Central California. So this is near Colinga. There's a big gas station there as you drive south on I-5 toward LA. Um, and Colinga stands for Coaling Station A. I guess it was on railroad tracks in California's history too. Anyway, um, the Kettleman Hills, I need to, sorry, I need to zoom in more, oops, wrong way. Zoom in a little bit more for me. Okay, so the Diablo Range, the Diablo Range, you know where that is, you guys? If you're from the Bay Area, you might. That's the, those are the hills and the East Bay that you can see. Um, Colinga is right there. Um, there's Fresno. And here's the Sierra Nevada. Okay, so the Sierra Nevada had been there for, um, well, the granites formed as recently as like 90 million years ago. So the Sierra Nevada were there prior to this. Um, but we didn't have our current, there was no San Andreas fault yet along our coast. This was still um, a subduction zone. And we'll get to this, we'll talk about those details. But um, between Fresno-ish and Colinga and Bakersfield, four million years ago, there was an inland sea. So things were slightly different. There was uh, um, 
higher sea level. Um, and sorry, I'm just trying to read this. Approximate location of, I can't read that. Oh, it's shoreline. Yeah, that's what it says. It's just estimating the shoreline is what's saying. So um, it, there was an inland sea that filled essentially what is now kind of flat part of the Great Valley that's in the cent center of the state. Let's look at a California map so that we know where this is um, in today's geology. I'll pull that up in a second. But um, so it was kind of like a bay, almost like San Francisco Bay. And it closed off between 4 million years and 1 million year ago. Um, the sea shrank and until today, like today, there's, there's no sea there. In fact, it's quite dry. This is the environment that those animals lived in. So they were living in, in shallowish water. It's not very deep. Um, it's not the deep ocean, but it, it's deeper in the center of this inland sea. Um, and then it gets shallower towards the coastline. Let's see. Okay, so, and it, the last question is, as you look at the diagrams in this final section, remember that the fossils can help us in interpreting past environments. So um, looking at the fossils and understanding where their modern relatives, like where do the gastropods, the snails live today? Where do the sand dollars live? Where do the scallops live? Um, and then you look at the geologic record in these fossils and make some inferences about the environment that existed when those rocks were deposited and when those fossils were alive. So this is asking, was the Kettleman Hills freshwater or saltwater? Was this a lake environment or was this the ocean essentially? Um, so that maybe seems deceptively simple, but that's all that it's asking you. And then it says, what evidence from the fossil record supports the change of environment between one and four million years ago? Think about the fossils that you saw and the environment that those fossils occupied when they were living, and then describe what you, what you think happened. So this diagram is guiding you in that direction. Um, I want you to take a stab at this without listening to me just explain. So I want you to take a stab at, um, at the end of, after have, having sketched all these fossils and looked at the rocks, I want you to try to answer that question about what, what change in environment did you see at Kettleman Hills? Okay, let me pull up, I'm gonna stop sharing. Any questions about this? So I hope that that actually won't take you all that long. Oh, there's a bunch of questions in the chat that I just see, okay. Um, there's a Google Jamboard that you can use to draw pictures. You can save them and import them to the lab. My Earth Systems class uses it. Awesome, what is that? What is a Google Jamboard? Can someone explain, like, is that a web page? Is this a... Do you use a stylus on an iPad? Like, what is this? Should I Google it? Let me find it. I'm gonna pull up the geologic map of California. Can someone answer that question? Um, let's see, was it Kay? It's like a website. Oh, <laughs> my kid is telling me what it is. <laughs> But is it easy to sketch with? Uh, I don't know about sketching, but you can like make circles and that. <laughs> you can draw circles, great. Well, okay. I've only ever accidentally pressed the circle button, so I don't know if there are other buttons. Okay. You can just Google it. Okay. Jamboard, is it up. okay? So I guess what I want to know is Google Jamboard any better or different from Google Drawings? Does it give you a, is it easier to use? Because Google Drawings is where I directed you for your drawing. Never use Google Drawings. You should try, it's really easy. 
uh, and it has a lot, a lot of functionality. It's really close to Adobe Illustrator, frankly. And um, so that's, it's been a great free resource that I can give to students without having access to uh, Ac uh, Adobe Illustrator. Thank you for that. I will check it out. Okay, so for the boxes, I'm not really sure. I draw, so I was answering the question, but the box isn't editable. So I just wrote in the same location. The box should be editable. Um, and if it's not, you can always delete the box and replace it with a paragraph of text or replace it with your own box. Uh, so uh, draw a new box and put in your own text there. There's because you have access to the Word document or on Google Docs, essentially the Word document, um, you can edit it. So go ahead and edit it. If you see the formatting is weird, go ahead and try to fix it or let me know and I'll try to fix it and update it. Um, but yeah, if you, if you find something like that, like it won't let you click in the box or something, draw on top of it or replace it, I'd, I'd say. Okay. Excuse me, this must be important. Sorry, sick kid at home. So it's uh, tricky. Okay. Um, right. Where were we? Okay, so there's the lab. Um, oh yeah, ma geologic map of California so that I can point to um, where Kettleman Hills is. Just pulling that up right now. Let me share my screen so you can see. It is the um, geological survey of California that that maintains or that creates the um, geologic map of California. And this is the page that I just got when I just typed in geologic map of California. It sure is pretty. <laughs> um, okay, so what I wanted to point out was here's, here, oops, I gotta stop touching this. Okay, here's San Francisco Bay. There's San Francisco. There's Monterey Bay. Um, Let's go in a little bit further. Oh, let me just explain. The pink is the, the Sierra Nevada mountains. The yellow part is the low central valley. The, the hot part that you always drive across and that's kind of boring for me where the, all the farms are. And um, uh, it's a lot of sedimentary rocks and I don't study sedimentary rocks as part of my research. So I don't normally go to the Central Valley very much. It's just like sort of a passing through zone for me on the way to the Sierra Nevada. Um, but this Central Valley um, is kind of like what you might imagine the, the inland sea looked like. If the sea level were higher and that area was flooded, you can imagine an inland sea inside California even today, um, at least as far as the landforms are concerned. But right now we have um, a lot, there are hills in the way. Those hills started forming when the Sierra Nevada was forming also. But um, just this green part, that's related to the subduction um, and the subduction is related to the generation of the granites that form in the Sierra Nevada. I'll talk about this more in plate tectonics and we talk about igneous rocks for sure uh, and metamorphic rocks in the green. Um, but these rocks that are in yellow, a little bit of pink, but mostly in yellow on the west side of these green rocks, these are all um, from Southern California. These are all rocks that were brought up along the San Andreas Fault. So um, they were not in this position one to four million years ago. The, um, the San Andreas Fault, okay, so just time-wise, 
the Sierra Nevada formed maybe between 120 and 90 million years ago, similar to these green set of rocks here that are part of, they're, they're essentially ophiolitic material. We talked about ophiolites on Tuesday briefly. Um, the material that's scraped onto the edge of the continent, that's what these are. And these are the granites that were formed from melting during, while subduction was going on. These rocks didn't um, arrive in their position until after the San Andreas was formed, which started maybe 30 to 25 million years ago. That's when the San Andreas Fault formed. And it formed first in Southern California down by the Salton Sea. This is the Salton Sea here. Used to be a resort, but now it's, um, it's hardly anything. There's not much water in it anymore. And it's really polluted as well. But um, the, let me zoom out a little bit. There, this area in the Gulf of California is actually spreading. It's starting to spread and separate Baja from mainland Mexico. And that plate boundary changes just at the top of the Gulf of California. And it transitions into the San Andreas Fault, which comes up through the Salton Sea area and it bends around like this um, east of LA and comes up the um, right in through here in these where you see this low lying valley. The San Andreas Fault comes up through here and goes offshore uh, in Daly City, just, just right here. Um, and that's, I'm, I, when we talk about the San Andreas and earthquakes and plate tectonics more, I'll, I'll show you some photos. In fact, I'll probably go either Google Earth images or go take some pictures for you because it's right here. Um, all the the sea, the cliffs here are falling into the ocean and there's a lot of erosion and the San Andreas Fault doesn't help things. There's a, a ton of landslides where it goes offshore, goes offshore and then comes back onshore and clips Point Reyes and separates, goes through Tomales Bay, separates Point Reyes from um, the rest of Marin and et cetera over there. And then it kind of goes along the, the coast and then it clips, it, it kind of clips these cliffs in here and then finally exits and goes offshore here at the Mendocino, um, the Cape of Mendocino right here. And then um, it meets two other plate boundaries in the ocean somewhere right about there. So that's the extent. So the San Andreas Fault goes from about here down California to about the, the end, the, the bottom of the Salton Sea, the southern end of the Salton Sea. So all of these rocks here on the, the left side or the west side have been moving into place slowly, moving north compared to the rest of California over time. And so um, these hills, even though the San Andreas is strike slip motion, these hills form along the coast down there because there's a tiny component of up vertical motion every time there's an earthquake, every time the, the San Andreas Fault actually slips. Tiny amount. So it's mostly horizontal. So there's mostly like a ton of this northward motion um, of these rocks to toward San Francisco. So LA and San Francisco will be neighbors at some point in geologic time. LA is gonna be right up next to it, but not for millions of years, right? So not in our lifetime. And the coast is never gonna fall into the ocean. Yeah, maybe we'll end up with, I don't know, an island or a small like continent offshore eventually, but for now, there's no risk of that. Okay, so where were we? Questions about anything I'm saying? I know I'm hitting you with a lot of geology. What did you use to describe the uh, red part on, on California? The red part? Yeah, the okay. northern part right there. This northern part is a lot of volcanic rocks. That um, there's, this is the southernmost end of the volcanism. Actually, this red dot in the middle of the Central Valley that is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Range, in, in the, where modern day 
uh, subduction is happening and where modern day volcanism, active volcanism is happening. So Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, all the volcanoes that are up here in Washington, some in um, Oregon, and then in northernmost California, there's volcanic activity. Lassen's up here. Um, where's Lassen? It is, oh my God, I could put my hand on it, but I'm not sure I could pinpoint it on this map. Um, Lassen is part of this. So um, Mount Lassen, if you've never been there, it's pretty spectacular and it's not that far from us. It's a great road trip for a weekend. Um, Lava Beds National Monument is also up here. That's over here. Um, so I think actually Lassen must be, so Lassen is in this area. Um, Shasta also, Mount Shasta is part of that volcanic system. Lassen last erupted in, I wanna say like 1934, something like that. So it's pretty recent actually. Um, and then there's Medicine Lake Volcano. We have our very own Shield Volcano in California, which I bet you didn't know, because Shield Volcanoes are like the Hawaiian Islands. They're really different from the pointy peaked volcanoes that we get like Mount Fuji or, or Mount St. Helens. Um, so that's what all of this is. It's, it's the younger relative to the, the Sierra Nevada belt. These rocks in pink never reach the surface. These all crystallized below the surface and have been uplifted and it was glaciers and um, erosion from ice and rain and wind that exposed the granites today. But above, like before that happened, volcanic rocks were erupting. So there should have been a layer of volcanic rocks on top of those pink rocks some time ago. And there still are little pieces. If you, if you go and look, you'll still see like little remnants. There are volcanic rocks in here every once in a while. So they're still, they're called roof pendants because they were the roof of the, the granites. The, the roof of that um, batholith, that big pile of granitic rocks. There's that little volcano. That's on private land too, so you can't get to, get to it except for special tours. Um, we are getting off track. So does that answer your question about the red rocks? Yeah, I did. Cool, okay. Um, this is a different terrain. We've got a, this is a whole bunch of like, um, there's a lot of mantle type rocks uh, up here, we'll get to at some point. Um, the southern, southeastern part of California, this is like the westernmost part of the Great Basin. So the series of ranges and valleys that kind of trend north-south. There's spreading going on here. It's not a plate boundary yet anyway, but the crust is thinning and stretching. And so you get these valleys in between the ridges. Um, and that's what you're seeing um, in the Mojave Desert, um, Death Valley. That's what Death Valley is over here, I think. Um, I still haven't found Colinga. Let's see if we can find it here, Colinga. Nice, okay. That was an excellent thing to happen. So the Kettleman Hills, I bet it's these this hill right here. Um, so where are we? Here's San Francisco, here's Monterey Bay, and here are the Kettleman Hills. Um, so that inland sea had formed, it, it wasn't part of the Monterey Bay um, system, but it formed in this area around Kettleman Hills. And it has since, we've had uplift along the coast, again, because of this, like the San Andreas, there's been a little bit of uplift. Um, sea level has been dropping uh, too over geologic time. So um, the combination of uplift of the land and a lowering sea level means that we lost that inland sea and we're left with the, the fossil record in those hills. You can see the sharp line where the San Andreas runs here. See that sharp line that is just to the right of these pink rocks? Da, 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 da. These pink rocks, guess where they came from? Uh, 
Anyone want to guess? I mean, I told you from the south. If you restore, if you were to like, if this were a paper model and you could cut along the San Andreas fault and then move those rocks, do a mental experiment with me again, move that, that left side a piece of paper south toward where LA is, where do they, where do you get to? Right here. They're, these are basically the southern extent of the, the Sierra Nevada. So we have Sierra and granites near Monterey because of the San Andreas Fault. And in fact, the same granites are right here in Pacifica at um, Montero Mountain and Devil Slide. So that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> So I'm glad we found Kettleman Hills. So the, I, I wanted to just wrap up kind of talking about the Kettleman Hills. We need to get to um, the last of my lecture slides and I wanna answer any questions about the Topo Map Lab too. So how about last questions about the Exploring Fossils Lab? Let me stop sharing. Anything, anything? Okay. So if you haven't finished the Exploring Fossils Lab, um, I would have the Word document or the Google Doc open while you watch, while you do the virtual field trip and zoom in on those images. And those were done with a special robot and camera. It's called a Gigapan robot that takes a series of hundreds or thousands of images it sits in one place and it holds just a regular else um, uh, regular digital camera basically and it, it's it takes all these photos and then they're overlapping like by 50 percent each one of them and then um, the software stitches it together to be a really high resolution image and that's why you can magnify so far that you can actually like look at the the sand grains and the sandstone and see the fossils in the outcrop. So it really is kind of like being there with a, a magnifying lens and, and looking closely at the rocks. But sit there with the lab, do the virtual field trip, listen to Lisa talk about the fossils and do your sketches. You can use the, um, uh, what's it called again? Google Jamboard or you can use Google Drawings. Um, either will work just fine. Um, and again, if you, want to work in Google Drawings and do your sketch there and then just export it or save it as a JPEG or a PDF, then you can pop it in to your lab in place of that, that white box. Yeah. Is that pretty clear to everyone? I guess if there are no questions that tells me it's fairly clear. Okay. Okay. Um, good, I have a thumbs up. Alrighty then. I suggest, um, why don't I take a couple of questions or a few questions on the Topo Maps Lab if you've got them, and then I'll share just the last few slides of the Earth History Lecture before noon. Any questions about your Topo Map Lab? Now, I, I went through most of it, parts one and two in the study group recording, and that's already on in the, the lab folder. So it was just part three where you download your own map and then answer those questions. Um, they were certainly, you could answer many of them by just reading the legend of the map and understanding how to read the legend. And I went through that um, a bit on Tuesday. And I also recorded that last night. That's the audio file that goes along with the slides. Um, for part three on the topo maps, um, yeah. when we have to download our own map. Does it have to be a map from, that's like a map from part part one? Or nope. does it have to be a Any map? map. No, any map. In the instructions, I say, choose a map where you're living now or where you grew up or any other special place that you want to look at, because I don't mind which topo map it is. If it's a topographic map that you grab from the USGS site that I sent you to, uh, it'll be fine. Any of those. 
um, it should have latitude and longitude on it. You know, it should be kind of a standard map and not like something special in a handout in a workbook or some special thing you like a special publication you might download on that accidentally. You just want the map. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to do part of Grand Canyon or Yosemite or go for it. Okay. Okay, so please turn the Topo Maps Lab in by the end of this week. And um, just because we hadn't talked about the Exploring Fossils Lab yet, I, I'll give you until next week to finish that up and turn it in. So you have until, I gave you till next Friday to turn that one in. But we're going to, I mean, we're going to be starting a new lab. So um, you should, let me just check. I don't think that there's a pre-lab with your geologic time exercise. I think you can go straight into it. Let me, I'm looking at iLearn real quick to see if that's the case. So your lab next week um, that you can start any time that you're done, but it's, uh, it's based on relative age dating and um, you need to, oh, well, I suppose you do need to understand some of the, the rules about how relative age dating works. Let me share this screen with you. So you would need to understand some of these. I have planned, I plan on going over this and doing some examples in the lab sec session next week. So Thursday next week. Um, but if you wanted to start it, you could certainly try some of these simple exercises. And basically it's asking you to use the, the rules, this one, in this case, the law of superposition to tell is rock D younger or older? Is rock A youngest and oldest? And you're supposed to put the rock layers, the different units in order from oldest to youngest by writing the corresponding letter. And the geology gets slowly more complicated and other things like folding happens. And so you need to understand, okay, um, the folding had to happen in this case before you could have an erosional surface and then lay down some flat sediments here. So I will give some examples like that and then set you free. But these are kind of fun puzzles. I really liked doing these when I was an undergrad. I thought it was, uh, they were interesting challenges. Um, and they, they get a lot more complex. I guess that's like a good example of one of the more complex ones. So there are faults, there are folds, there are erosional surfaces, there are intrusions of igneous rocks. So they get fairly complicated. And hopefully the formatting isn't this wonky because I fixed that document so many times. Oh my God. Okay. So I'm going to let that be because I wanted to do that in detail next week. All right. So let me, if there are no further questions, I am going to pull up the last. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for that, that lab you just did, um, there's no place to turn that in. Which, the geologic time one? Yeah, the time one. I haven't gotten to it yet. That's okay, it's, it's, next, it's next week. So <laughs> I, I can create, let me, I'll leave myself a note to submit the geologic time. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I liked it. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. And that's good. That's a good thing to say so everybody else can um, look forward to it. So I'll put a place to submit that. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I think I'll probably also add a website you can go that is a radiometric dating exercise. So anyone who finishes this lab, you can go on and, um, and do a different kind of um, age dating exercise too, um, to kind of fill in the gaps there. But yeah, I'll get to that. I'll do that today. Okay, so let me pull up. Jira Earth, here we go. Okay, we left off. And like, and normally, I'm gonna have to cut my lectures, like pare it down to the real essentials because um, we don't have a lot of time in class together to actually talk about just everything. 
that's why reading is important. Like reading your textbook, which I also hope you're enjoying the textbook because it's not too wordy. It gets right to the point and it's got great diagrams and interactive stuff. Okay, so I I improved this uh, I improved this lecture by adding some extra slides like dredge samples. I I added in some example of what dredging looks like in a lab on board a ship. Um, I added in. Um, Oh, you saw that one before. I added in here. This is uh, ocean drilling. That was the last example of where you get evidence of mantle compositions. Here's a, an example of one of, this is one of the drill ships that's used by scientists all over the world. This is the one of the US ships. This is the drill that they actually use and the, the core. And these are the actual cores that come out from the seafloor. So the cores are brought out and they're immediately split in half. One half is preserved. The other half is used um, for research and they're stored at a facility in Texas in a climate controlled facility. And as a researcher, you can apply to get some of the sediment from any of these drill cores that you want to work on. If you want some fossils from a particular zone and they scoop out a little bit and send it to you in the mail. It's kind of crazy, but half is always preserved. And then the job of the people on board ships like this one, um, they bring a crew of scientists along these trips that last sometimes months, but definitely at least a month because they got to pick people up and then go out to the middle of the ocean and then put the drill down. And it's, it's a complicated process. It's really expensive too. Um, but the scientists on board log everything. There's a paleontologist, a sedimentologist. They always bring specialists for the place that they're drilling. And they do a lot of that science on board the ship before they ever get home. Okay, we looked at density increasing towards the mantle, uh, towards the core. We looked at these discontinuities. We started talking about seismic waves and how seismic waves move faster in denser rock and slow down in liquid. We talked about the difference in P and S waves and how P waves travel through any material, liquid or solid, and S waves only travel through solid materials. And so we get these shadows around the outer core. And that's part of how we discovered it, the outer core. This is where we ended up. So there are just a few slides. We can do this. We can stay on time today. That's my goal. Okay, so how did the earth get its current structure? Um, we're starting back from like the early earth, back when it formed about 4.7 billion years ago. GA, everyone, well, you guys know what gigabytes are. This is giga annum. Um, G-I-G-A means a billion, and annum means year. It's Latin for year, A-N-N-U-M. And we abbreviate geologic time either as G-A for giga for billions of years or capital M-A for mega annum, that's millions of years, or just a lowercase k-A for thousands of years. So anyway, this means 4.7 billion years old. Um, that's when the early earth formed from accretion of material from space, small planetesimal, small bodies that get bombarded. Before we, there was an atmosphere, there was nothing to protect earth from bombardment by asteroids, comets, whatever's going to hit a dead planet. There was no structure to the planet, meaning there was no crust mantle core early on, it was just a ball of rock. Um, and dead referring to meaning like there's, there's no magmatism, there's no, plant, uh, there's no plate tectonics at all. It, maybe it looked more like the moon than it does Earth today. Then um, that protoplanet, the early Earth, grew over time by the same sort of methods, uh, accretion of these uh, other bodies that impact these extraterrestrial impacts. Um, so every time you get a bombardment, you're increasing the mass of the earth. 
um, as the planet grew in size, the gravitational field also grew and that attracted even more objects from space. And then um, we talked about how uh, meteorites, they might be iron meteorites that are these uh, metal rich extraterrestrial bodies, these stony meteorites or chondrites that are more rock-like and more, more like earth more like mantle, um, and then icy fragments, so comets. Ice in comets is probably where Earth got its water from at, to start. So all of this means like every time it was bombarded, we were adding to the material that comprises the Earth today. So this is where we were getting all of those materials to form the core and the mantle, except that it was all uniform in composition originally. Um, okay, so heat. All this says is basically, here's a couple of images of, there's hale -Bopp. I was alive for hale -Bopp. That was the last comet that um, came around that was visible for a really long time. It was pretty spectacular um, to have a comet that was, that looked this awesome. So next chance you get, go, go hunting. Did anybody go see the solar eclipse a couple years ago? That, that was amazing. I went on a road trip to, um, yeah, I don't know why I'm talking about this now. Comments made me think of the solar eclipse, but that seeing hale -Bopp, seeing the solar eclipse, that was amazing. There's somebody chatting here. Solar eclipse was cool. It was very cool. Yeah. Oh my God. That was something else. Any chance you get, go see a solar eclipse. So the point of this slide is that um, the gravitational field increased and Earth's internal heat increased. So then we're starting to get more heat, more gravity. Those things are going to start to help form the internal structure of the Earth. This is um, a pellet of um, plutonium-238. Um, it's plutonium dioxide. This is used as the power source for the Cassini mission that went to Saturn or the Galileo mis mission that went to Jupiter. Um, and it's glowing because it, the, there's radioactive heat being generated. So as there's radioactive decay is happening and plutonium-238 is breaking down um, to different isotopes, it's giving off heat at the same time. Um, that heat is from radioisotopes is, and radi you might think of them as unstable isotopes. So they don't last for very long. A lot, most of them don't last for very long. There are some that have a very long half-life, meaning it takes a very long for them to decay to a stable um, isotope or a stable um, element, essentially. So um, that, decay contributed to the heat that we've got in the inner part of Earth now. And this is just a plot of heat with depth in Earth. So this goes from the surface and this marks like those major discontinuities that I was talking about. Um, here's the D double prime layer just outside this discontinuity that we were talking about, the source of um, Hawaiian, oops, Hawaiian plumes and stuff like that. These values are in Kelvin again, so you've got to subtract 273 degrees to get how much it, the value is in Celsius. The point is it's thousands of degrees hot <laughs> in Fahrenheit or Celsius, whichever measure you've got. And so the core is incredibly hot, 7,000 degrees K, hot, hot, hot. That's why molten iron exists in the outer core because it's so hot. Okay, so um, the young earth, I'm just looking down at this white text so that you don't have to read separate from my words. Um, there were more radioactive elements, a lot with short lot half lives, like I was saying. Um, aluminum 26 is an example of one of those. They decay and basically go extinct and we don't have any more aluminum 26 or unless it's added to our system or unless it comes from some other decay process. Um, Others like uranium-238 or this plutonium-238. I'm not sure about plutonium. 
I don't know what its half-life is, half -life is but um, uranium-238 uh, and 236, thorium is equally radioactive to uranium. Um, we use uranium to, and thorium to, to date, to get an age for rocks sometimes because their, their half-life is essentially the, the age of the earth. So um, we can date very old events. In fact, some of the oldest dates that I've gotten from zircons that contain this uranium-238 um, are like 3 billion years old, which is kind of cool to see. But I haven't been working on the old, I haven't been working, my research isn't focused on the early Earth, it's focused on processes that are later involved in continental collisions. So I haven't done this very old dating, the 4.7 billion stuff. But okay, so radioactive de decay is happening. Some of those isotopes from the very early Earth are still decaying today. Um, so the, the, this heat content of the early Earth was a product of the greater abundance of these radioactive elements or isotopes, a greater number of impacts because we didn't have an atmosphere yet, and just heating that's generated from the compression of the overlying rock. So burial of rock um, deeper down, closer to the heat source in interior earth also um, increases heat. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Um, that initial accretion of these different particles start gave us this homogeneous earth, like I said, kind of moon-like, um, except much larger. It was a, a, a loose amalgam of metallic fragments like the iron meteorites, rock fragments, icy fragments. Um, heat was in, increasing. Um, and the, the young planet became density and compositionally stratified. So the, the, the gravity that was increasing as the size of the planet built up essentially pulled those metallic materials to the center of the earth. And as they got hotter, melting started to happen. And when melting happens, then you have buoyant materials that then can rise toward the surface. And when you get melt that starts to rise toward the surface, then you start to get eruptions. And that's when you can start to build continents. So the early Earth didn't have continents, didn't have plate tectonics, it didn't have an atmosphere. Um, it was the early processes, though, that led to us having all of that. Stop me if you've got questions. Um, Earth's core is pretty large and we draw it, not necessarily to scale, but our, 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 the diagrams I've shown you have been to scale. The core, that's the inner and outer core, is larger than Mars. Um, it's one sixth the volume and a third of the mass of the Earth. So a third of the mass of the Earth is the core, one third. It's a lot. So that means two thirds are the mantle and crust. So the mantle is a, a major component of the earth too, but the, the core is nothing to make fun of. Okay, the inner core has um, three million atmospheres pressure, that's its conditions, and temperatures that are over 6,000 degrees Celsius. Um, it's about 70% of the size of the moon. So we, <laughs> we almost have a, a moon inside of our planet a moon-sized thing. Um, it is, the entire core is mostly metallic iron with some nickel, Ni is nickel, and Si is silicon. Um, and then the physical state of the core is different, right? We talked about the outer core being molten and the inner core being solid. So those are two differences. And I've got, I've got some more information on that here. So the outer core is, um, always so hot that the metal iron, metallic iron and nickel are always molten. Um, but the pressures, I talked about how the pressure um, can suppress melting. So the intense pressures at the inner core of the earth are so high that they suppress the melting. And even though it's even hotter than the outer core, it's a solid sphere inside inside that um, inner part of the core. Um, 
Yeah, so you get an idea, it's two th almost 2000 degrees increase in temperature between the outer, the outermost part of the outer core to the inner core. And yeah, there's its depth. You don't need to, you certainly don't need to know the, the depths for goodness sakes. Don't need to memorize that kind of thing. Have a good idea approximately how big the earth is. And I mentioned this is a, a, an illustration of, or a, a cartoon of what the earth's magnetic field might look like. This part in the center, the spherical looking thing is supposed to be a representation of the spinning of the metallic iron um, and the magnetic field being generated by the spin of that metallic iron in the outer core. And then the magnetic field that it generates that goes out the poles, it goes out the North Pole and goes out the South Pole. So there's a magnetic North Pole and a magnetic South Pole. We talked about that when it came to the topo maps too, because the, we looked at the magnetic declination where the North arrow was pointing straight up on our topo maps. And we had this arrow that was 13 degrees offset that pointed to the Earth's magnetic North. So it's not quite aligned with our geography and it's probably due to the, the tilt of the Earth and just the way that it's spinning. Okay, have you ever seen an aurora, a, a aurora borealis, I assume? That's, that's another spectacular natural phenomena that is um, worth seeing too. I saw that in Alaska. The best one was in the Yukon terrain or Yukon territory in Western Canada. It was, you know, I, I've traveled a lot as a geologist. That's one of the side benefits of this job is <laughs> a lot of traveling, usually to go see geology and learn about geology in a particular place. And this was coming back from a trip in Alaska and uh, we just drove from Palo Alto uh, to, to Washington, got on a ferry, took that to Haines, Alaska on the inside passage, did some geology and then drove the car back. Um, that's a pretty spectacular trip too. And it's pretty amazing you can do it in a car. Okay, last few comments on this um, set of slides. This diagram is probably the most important of all the, of everything contained in this lecture. This is probably it because this talks, this shows you the difference in the compositional layers of the earth. We talked about the metallic core, the iron and magnesium silicates that are in the mantle. And then um, this, there are more silicates in the crust, but many fewer iron and magnesium silicates and more, more sodium, more potassium, and lots more silica. That's SiO. Um, the silicon and oxygen are together um, bonded in a, like a tetrahedron, like in a pyramid shape within a lot of these um, minerals. So, um, the chemistry of the crust really is different from the mantle, but there are some similarities. And we'll get into that when we look at the rocks. The mechanical, so the strength, I guess, I don't know that mechanical help, that word helps me understand this or that physical either helps me, but considering like the strength of these layers, how they behave, their physical state, maybe that's a better way to put it meaning this is a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, a solid lower mantle. There's the asthenosphere that is not shown on this, but the asthenosphere is just beneath the lithosphere. So the, the outermost part of the mantle is solid like the crust is. That forms the lithosphere. Underneath that, we've got the asthenosphere, and that's what the plates glide around on. So the lithosphere makes up the plates, the asthenosphere lets them move around, and um, the, but the pressure underneath the asthenosphere, the pressure of the, the lower part of the mantle is too high, it suppresses that melting. So except for the plumes that come from that D double prime layer at the very bottom of the mantle and on the outside of the outer core, that's where the, the plumes of melt that are generated that, that 
pierce the crust eventually and give us places like hot spots like Hawaii and Iceland. Um, that's what that's all about. So if I were you, I would be able to sketch something like this um, and label it correctly in terms of compositional layers and in top and in terms of like the physical properties. So um, you will see certainly several questions on the interior part of the earth on your exam and something like this. I promise. The last thing I'm going to say, it's, it's noon and we got there. This is our last slide. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is plate tectonics. That's where this is all leading. Understanding the interior part of the earth and the reason that I moved chapter eight to the second week instead of talking about plate tectonics first is I wanted to give you a basis for the plate tectonics and that's the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. So I needed you to understand that we had this gooey layer not a completely molten layer. It's not writing on liquid. It is writing on a gooey plastic. You could think of it maybe as silly putty stretching or something like that, but even more viscous, even harder to flow and stretch. That's what the asthenosphere is. We have plumes that come up or melts that come up and um, places where there's upwelling of hotter material in the mantle where we get hot spots and mid-ocean ridges where crust is created and that drives the plates away from each other and eventually colder and older crust when it arrives at another plate um, one's got to win one's got to stay at the surface and one is going to get subducted because we're not increasing the volume of earth we mean we we're, we're keeping, Earth isn't expanding and it's not shrinking. We're keeping the volume and keeping its mass. So anywhere we create crust, we're, we're also destroying crust somewhere else. So the subduction zones take that, that colder, older material back down into the mantle. It sinks to the lower part of the mantle. And then the hot, more buoyant stuff is right, material and magmas are rising and creating new crust at mid-ocean ridges and hot spots. So we are going to get to, we're going to talk about geologic time next week, and then we get into plate tectonics. Uh, I'm just going to check to make sure that's correct. Yes. So we do geologic time next week. Then we're going to talk about plate tectonics. That is going to be a fun lab. I think you're going to enjoy using Google Earth. So if you don't have Google Earth yet, you, you should totally get it and play with it if you haven't. Um, but that's all I've got to say today. And um, good luck with your labs. Hit me with any questions. I plan on doing the study group again tomorrow from 11 to 1. Um, and you're, anyone's welcome to show up. And if you can't make it, you can watch the recording or send me questions or ask for a, an appointment or simply stay after class right now and we can talk. Okay, I'll see you Tuesday if there are no other questions. Otherwise, um, hang out and we can chat. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. You guys have a nice weekend. Thanks, President. Bye. Uh, I just have a quick question about yeah. the topo map, topo map slide. Yeah, sure. What is it? Um, well, I actually um, printed out the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, even though I did some of it on the computer. Okay. And I did some of it while printing.
while um it's also printed out like in pencil as well. Okay. So, so this so some of the stuff that's um in pencil, how how do you want me to like turn that in? Do you want me to, like sc um screenshot it and then like, totally. turn it in? you can screenshot you can take a picture and add it to your lab. Um, that's probably the easiest way is simply to insert it as a picture at the end of your lab or in the right position and place in your lab if you want. Okay, and then um, you, can, you know how to do that. Uh, I do not actually. Okay. Um, so do you use Word or do you use Google Docs? Um, it's on my Google Docs actually. Okay. So let me open a Google Docs page and we can look at something like that together. Okay. Um, let me share the screen. Come on. Oh, maybe it's this one. Nope, wait. Okay, this is the right page. Okay, I'm just gonna start a new document here. Um, so in Google Docs, um, I would go to insert image, upload from computer. So if you can um, get like email yourself the picture or text yourself the picture and get it onto your computer, then you can choose this option and simply upload it from a file on your computer and it will, it'll, it'll, you go through and you search, you find the image that you want. Um, I don't know what these are, but um, it would insert it as a box. You can resize it by just holding the, the corners and just making it fit the page where you want. Um, so you can save that as its own page and add it at the end of your lab or just copy that image once it's in your the Google Doc and then paste it into your lab. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? It, yeah. Okay. And then the one but then the one that I already done that I already done that's not in pencil, do I like how can I explain it? Do I like turn that in like, like first hand? Could you, can you put it into a single document or is that going to be too tricky? How do you mean like single document? So um, if you did some things by hand, you can take pictures of those pages, insert them like this into your Google doc. And then it's just like an extra page that you can copy and add at the end of your lab. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So instead of just like one diagram, take a picture of the entire page. And then when you put it in Google Docs, you can um, size the whole thing so that it fits. Like you can increase the size so that it takes up most of the page. And I should be able to read that. Okay. Um, if, if you're able to do that, if not, it's okay to upload multiple different documents. That's not a big deal. Okay. Okay. Just make sure that they're all that everything's there, right? If you're not sure what I'm talking about, it might be easier if like you I could you could share your screen maybe and I can help guide you through it. Um you know, is it or I guess I asked for that to be turned in this week. So do you want to try something like that now and and uh, I, I can show you mine real quick just to see. Okay, let me, wait, I think I have to give you permission to, uh, sorry, hang on. I got to stop sharing this and I've got to, okay, go ahead and share. I'm just gonna, I have to grab my power cord, just a sec. Okay. There we go. Okay. So here's your lab, I see. Like I, I already did like like um all this page. Uh-huh. And then 
this one as well. Like um, if you look, uh, um, like I marked down the uh, ridges on uh, and the valleys uh -huh. on the map. In pencil, you mean? It, well, actually, in pen, like I'm, I did it in red and blue pen. Okay. And then for this one, I labeled like the uh, numbers and every and everything. So in this case, like um, this, so I don't know if this would be more or not any more work for you, but you could just take a picture of just the diagram that you drew on and in, and then just like delete this diagram and insert that one instead. Okay. But if it screws up the formatting or anything and it's just getting too difficult, slap it in at the end and then you don't have to worry about the formatting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. If you have any trouble, let me know. Mm -hmm. And just one more question. It's just, it's just about the uh, quiz as well. Um, okay. It's just um, how many attempts are we allowed on the quizzes? As many as you want, but don't waste your time. Like they're, they're only all the quizzes together are worth 15% of your grade. 15. So it's not a huge component. It's meant to be more practice than it is a test. Um, do it one, two, three times at most. By then you've seen enough of the correct answers that, right, you're not really learning anything anymore. I don't think you're probably just like trying to put in the right selection. So get as much as you can out of taking it the first or second time and then just call it good. We're, I'm gonna drop your two lowest scores anyway. Um, so yeah, I would, don't worry about it too much. Okay. Spend more, the, your labs are worth 60% of your grade. So spend your time on your labs. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great day. You too.